Thanks, Dana. While my presentation is loading, I'd like to uh, tell you that I really appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you through this webinar. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give was primarily funded uh, by the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy, who uh, are actively trying to get more anaerobic digesters uh, built on our large dairies across the U.S. and recognizing that digesters alone don't solve all the problems incorporating nutrient recovery aspects as well. So I'll present mostly that information that I did for the Innovation Center. I want to put a caveat here that because the Innovation Center emphasizes the installation of digesters, uh, I have quite a bit of components here talking about digesters and how nutrient recovery can uh, be linked to digesters, but by no means, as Dana has shown, do you have to do nutrient recovery or nutrient partitioning with a digester. You could use thermal processes, just land application, using belt presses, a variety of systems, one of which will be further explored in our last speaker, Dr. Joe Harrison. Uh, I'll start off with anaerobic digestion, just a brief background. Uh, there are multiple reasons why to install digesters, even though they are costly in terms of capital costs and do have some operating costs. And because of that, there is a limitation to the size of farm that they can be installed on and still have a positive economic return. But assuming that you can accomplish all that, get them on the appropriate dairy, there's significant reductions in odor, very significant destruction of indicator pathogens. Uh, one of our best mechanisms across the world in entrapping and utilizing methane emissions, which is an intensive greenhouse gas. You can produce uh, electrical power at about 0.25 kilowatts per cow per year, or uh, an emerging trend now that electrical prices are quite low is to try to clean up the biogas, scrub out the impurities, and make pure methane, compress it as a transportation fuel, and can produce about 167 diesel gallon equivalents per cow per year. That's assuming that you're just doing dairy manure. Uh, there are other benefits as well, uh, stabilizing volatiles, reducing solids, producing a fiber product, and doing some nutrient shifting, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Because, as I alluded before, that the economics can be a little bit of a concern, many of these sites are now doing what's uh, called active co-digestion and that is that they'll bring in outside waste um, and digest it with the manure. This slide is showing that we do have quite a bit of organic waste, particularly food scraps that our municipalities are doing a much better job of collecting. Um, if you bring in these outside wastes that haven't gone through an animal's digestion process, they have more energy contained in them, and because they have that more energy, the, the anaerobic digestion process can produce more biogas even two to four times uh, the amount of biogas that the manure produces. Meanwhile, um, as Dana has alluded, that we, we do have a manure wastewater that's produced at many of our uh, animal operations. Dairies in particular with their flush and scrape systems produce uh, quite a bit of volume of manure wastewater. Contained in that wastewater is quite a bit of nitrogen and phosphorus that have been of some concern uh, towards uh, numerous air, water, climate issues. I'm going to give you a case study here of what's typically done on an existing anaerobic digester. This particular case study is uh, at a, a dairy in uh, southern Idaho, but it could be applied across the country. Uh, sorry about the little bit of the washing out of the slide. But um, see if you can follow on that there is a, this particular farm has 3,000 lactating cows. The manure from that farm plus a little bit of substrate, and what I mean by substrate is that outside farm waste material, um, is brought in, put in, both of them are put into the digester and the digester produces electricity. In this case, could produce renewable fuel also if uh, they wanted to. After the digestion process and the production of electricity, there's still this liquid product that comes out of the digester. They run it through a screening system to uh, separate out fiber material that can be used as bedding. And in this case, they go for a higher value use, uh, sell it as magic dirt to uh, stores as a soil amendment peat moss replacement. 
and still after you remove that fiber there's still a diluted liquid wastewater um, that part is circled up there on the, the graph image and they don't do a whole lot of treatment at this site and what I'm emphasizing here is that if you are co-digesting and co-digestion is bringing extra nutrients to the farm um, and your farm might already have some concerns about nutrients maybe you want to have an active nutrient recovery component in addition to the digester and that's what the rest of this presentation is about it's how can you install a digester and then on the back end of it include some type of nutrient recovery technology to concentrate or recover the nutrients I'll start with uh, some technologies that can recover phosphorus or primarily phosphorus and I'll start with that fiber separation process just about every single digester that's been installed across the US at the 160 some uh, facilities on dairies in the US incorporates this separation process for fiber right after the digester it can be slope screens like down on the bottom uh, picture or it can be a screw press up at the top there um, the goal is to just use a mesh size size opening or a screwing action to be able to uh, preferentially collect the larger fiber solids and dewater them a bit and I said that those solids could be part of your business plan either as an offset for bedding or selling um, as a soil amendment while collecting that fiber material you are removing some of the phosphorus and the nitrogen from your stream because the fiber contains nutrients within it so you can think of the fiber separation process as a nutrient uh, recovery system even though it's mostly considered just a standalone fiber producing unit operation the costs are about five to six dollars per cow per year operation maintenance 32 to 36 per cow capital costs at these sites and you can produce a fiber product that's about 70 percent moisture and depending on if you use it for its lower value use bedding or higher value use peat moss replacement get five to fifteen dollars per yard so you do get a little bit of nutrient removal just in the baseline but it's not very much so if you want to do some additional phosphorus removal you need to add on an additional uh, technology the an addition, another type of technology that you could add on uh, to get you some more phosphorus removal is one of two types the solid solid polymer coagulation system that Dana pretty much talked about or a struvite crystallization system that uh, our third speaker Joe Harrison is going to talk about both of these systems have their strengths and, and maybe a few weaknesses um, they operate differently but both of them can accomplish an overall 75 to 80 percent phosphorus removal from that wastewater leaving the digester or leaving the manure stream in the case of struvite it doesn't have to work with a digester it can work standalone with fresh manure um, you can see that to get to this higher level of phosphorus removal you have extra operation and maintenance costs and extra capital costs capital costs on the order of the hundreds of dollars and the operation in the 50 to 100 some dollars uh, this slide is showing that there's a variety of companies out there that uh, have different approaches different performance capabilities costs the scale at which they're trying to demonstrate it um, but the point is that if you can do digestion and then remove the fiber product and then if you add in one of these technologies I think the two strongest ones uh, indicative ones would be that struvite or that polymer coagulant process that Dana talked about you can get uh, about 80 some percent removal of phosphorus at a cost though. now nitrogen treatment nitrogen treatment is a little bit trickier there are about four basic ways that you could remove nitrogen the first one on that list is um, recognizing that a lot of the nitrogen is in organic form or solid form and you still could use that polymer screening type operation that we use for phosphorus to remove that organic nitrogen 
And you could get a decent amount of nitrogen recovery through that screening type process or trying to capture the organic solids. If you want to go higher, though, you need to try to capture the ammonia. And especially if you're doing a digester, because a digester converts a fraction of the organic nitrogen to ammonia. So you have overall more ammonia in the process. One way to remove ammonia is to do ammonia stripping. Um, if you, and the interesting thing about removing ammonia and stripping it out is you can try to collect that ammonia and stabilize it as an ammonia fertilizer, uh, like ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, ammonium citrate and sell that fertilizer product. Two other approaches involve taking the nitrogen, be it organic or ammonia, and using biology to convert it to non-reactive nitrogen gas that is just blown off into the air. Uh, the two systems that do that are partial nitrification or full nitrification, denitrification. Uh, I won't go into the complexities of the systems. They just use slightly different pathways. The point here is that you can remove quite a bit of nitrogen, but you don't get a saleable product at the end. You just get nitrogen gas that you blow off into the atmosphere. Another lesson to learn from this slide is that unlike the phosphorus technologies that were capital of around $100, uh, operating around $50 to $100, look at these capitals, three, four hundred, five hundred dollars $500, and the O&M uh, even a little bit higher, maybe as high as $150. I have a slide here with some pictures of some of the different technologies and companies that are trying to uh, promote these uh, at the scale that they're presently being studied at. Um, point being, again, is that they center mostly around, do you want to turn it into nitrogen gas and not get a saleable product? Do you want to strip out ammonia? Or do you want to really kind of just do a solid separation and try to just get the organic fraction out? Combined treatments. Because nitrogen is so expensive to remove, it just makes pretty clear engineering sense that, you, that if you're going to do nitrogen, you might as well do phosphorus at the same time. If you're a farm, though, that really is only controlled by phosphorus, then don't spend the money to try to do nitrogen. So I think you'll see in the future, if this, these nutrient recovery technologies evolve, you'll have farms that do just phosphorus controls and others that will do phosphorus and nitrogen combined. There are also other systems out there that uh, I think was beyond this presentation, but that are intriguing. You know, you've heard probably a lot about algae and its ability to produce biofuel, uh, and maybe what its future is for our country and our world. Uh, still a lot of hurdles to accomplish algae, but one of the things that algae does besides be able to produce biofuel is it's wonderful at, at uh, absorbing and taking in the nutrients and, and cleaning up wastewater. Um, I want to also point out that, again, like I said before, that some combined treatments do not have to involve uh, anaerobic digestion. You could do thermal processes like Dana talked about with uh, the gasifiers. Here's a couple companies that uh, have different approaches, but basically they try to get a dry solid fraction like the poultry farm did, or relatively dry, and put it through their gasifier to get electricity or heat, or uh, in the case of AWS, they have a possibility of going even further to uh, make a fuel, and the remaining wastewater is either just lagoon field applied or they'll add in another, another operation, say like that partial denitrification to remove some of the additional nitrogen. But point being here, you don't have to incorporate anaerobic digestion by any means. There are some of our states that are um, not only concerned with nitrogen and phosphorus, but are particularly concerned with salt, you know, California being one of them, uh, and really looking for technologies to be able to uh, remove salts. Uh, as you know from our municipal wastewater industry and down in the Arabian peninsulas where they're doing desalination plants, you can remove salts. And here's a schematic of an approach that some companies are proposing where you would uh, take the manure, digest it to make power, or fuel, separate out that uh, fiber material for a valued product, um, add a centrifuge DAF unit, kind of like what uh, we've talked previously in Dana talked to get mostly phosphorus out, some more solids out. Then incorporate uh, ultrafiltration or membranes to uh, get even finer solids out. 
move to reverse osmosis. The reverse osmosis system will produce two streams for you, a clean water stream and then a, a waste stream that's basically salt water. Um, you could take that salt water and put it in a vacuum evaporator to kind of blow off some of the water and get a concentrated salt solution, in this case an 807 fertilizer. Uh, you, if you were able to do this entire process, you would get a salt fertilizer, you know, pretty good strength that could be saleable. You would get clean water so you could discharge to the streams or feed it directly back to your cows, and you could get some power. The problem being to incorporate all of those systems is an intensive capital and intensive operating costs. You'd probably be using all of your power to just run your internal systems and considerable operating and capital costs to install all the unit operations. Uh, here's a slide where we tried to give a, a summary of some of the different key techno technological approaches. Uh, they're on the bottom. On the left is the combined nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So like when I say in column two, 60% removal, that means you're getting rid of 60% of the total phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, you can see that they can increase in performance, but also as you're increasing in performance on the right side of the, uh, of the graph gives a cost estimate for total operating and total capital. You can see that as performance goes up, the cost kind of goes up, particularly if you're going to a, a salt removal, which could be extremely high. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about a system that WSU developed and has licensed with uh, a company out of Wisconsin, DBO. The system that we've developed and are now uh, demonstrating at several different sites is a four-step system that components, uh, some that can be taken out, some that you don't have to necessarily do all four. Um, first is do the anaerobic digestion in the blue. Second is separate out those fiber materials in the purple. Third is use ammonia stripping, and we have a patented process to be able to strip out the ammonia without chemical addition, um, bring the cost down, produce ammonium sulfite, sulfate to sell as a fertilizer either by adding gypsum or sulfuric acid. Gypsum should allow us to get organically certified for that product. That's in the orange. And the fourth product, or fourth unit operation would be to then take out the really fine solids that uh, the phosphorus is associated with. They're in particular using a DAP operation that uh, has been previously mentioned. At the end of those four, if you used all four of those unit operations, the demonstrations at the different sites are showing about 70% total nitrogen removal, 80% total phosphorus removal, and about 20 to 30% potassium removal. You could choose to not do the orange unit, the nitrogen unit, which is a costly unit, and then your nitrogen removal would go down significantly, but your phosphorus should still stay relatively high. Uh, I got uh, pictures there of the four different demonstration sites. These are full-scale demonstrations, so they're treating all of the wastewater at each of the sites across the country. Uh, I've broken down the unit operations and their performance. These are the best case performance. You know, we've done a lot of tweaking and changing and engineering. Uh, still are striving to continue to, to do more engineering to bring costs down, to bring performance up. Uh, there's also a picture there of uh, the different products, you have fibrous products, showing that it can be a good soil amendment to grow potted plants. The second picture is showing the system that produces ammonium sulfate, and there's ammonium sulfate being loaded to a tractor to be put onto fields. And the third is the uh, raw phosphorus solids that are removed with the DAF unit, both in wet form and dry form. Give you an idea of cost. Um, to do this particular system, I need a lot of electricity to strip out the ammonia. I need acid or gypsum uh, to be able to contact it to make the fertilizer. I need polymer to pull out the phosphorus. I need labor, contingency parts. Um, the daily operating cost then would be $1,200 per, $1, per day for a 5,200 wet cow equivalent system. 
that costs about $2.75 million in capital costs. If you could sell the products, and I emphasize if because they're very immature markets, uh, it's difficult to find good pricing, find contracts, uh, overcome the hurdles of an infant, infant market. If you could do all that, you theoretically could sell at about twelve ninety five, and try to break even. Um, there, therein lies is the hurdle for many of these technologies. It's not the technology we're trying to provide. Is that we're getting pretty close to being able to show that it can be robust, it can, and you can get a good performance, you can count on it, um, but it just might not be economically viable. Um, and if you have to go to financing to banks, uh, they might be leery of financing this because you're not getting a very good return, and uh, there might not be a whole lot of installations out there to base uh, the performance on. Real quick about something called partitioning. One of the big problems that Dana alluded to is that you have a lot of wastewater being applied to very nearby fields. One of the main reasons they're being applied to nearby fields is it's just too expensive to haul and truck, really dilute manure, and it ends up being very costly. What incorporating nutrient recovery technology could do, whatever technology you're utilizing, is you're trying to produce a wastewater that has much less nutrients in it. So maybe now you can get away with putting all of that wastewater on your local fields, still meet the nutrient management plan, and not have to haul to a second distant field that's in this example. And it was just comparing the economics. In the first scenario, first column, it's when you'd have no nutrient recovery. You're, you're just taking all of your manure wastewater and you're applying it to those 3,000 acres, some of it close, some of it far away. Because some of it's far away, you're having to do fuel and labor costs. Scenario two, though, is you do nutrient recovery and you end up with a situation where you could apply all of that low nutrient valued wastewater in your nearby fields and then take your recovered nutrients, your concentrated nutrients, and send them to the the distant field. You can see there could be almost a cutting in cost by half, a very significant financial impact to some of these larger dairies that are having to haul manure. And last is this consideration. Uh, I will, I'll just quickly go some of, through these uh, later at your convenience. You can look at some of these. I think these would be useful for regulators, uh, project developers who are thinking of working with technologies such as this. Recognize that manure is different than municipal wastewater. Many of these technologies are first derived out of municipal wastewater treatment plants. You can't directly take what they use and put it onto an animal farm situation with manure. It has to be tweaked. It has to be changed. You have to recognize that there are differences. You also recognize that all manures are not the same. One technology that might be really good for dilute dairy manure is not necessarily going to be good for swine manure or poultry manure or even scraped dairy manure or feedlot manure. Um, each project area is different. Some are under phosphorus management, some are more concerned with salt, some are nitrogen management. So the choice of technology is going to be regionally or locally dictated. Uh, alluded to removal versus recovery. Maybe right now, because you have infant markets for selling biofertilizers, maybe it's more cost conducive for you to blow off the nitrogen as non-reactive nitrogen gas. Um, maybe at a later date where we have nutrient trading programs and we have uh, firm markets, then it would make sense to make fertilizers and do ammonia stripping or struvite or other things. Um, some technology providers might be trying to push technology that hasn't been demonstrated at full scale. Any engineer knows that you better demonstrate at full scale and have all the hard lessons learned beforehand. Um, some of the systems are batch versus continuous, and uh, from an engineering perspective, you'd like to have more of a continuous operation. Operating versus capital. You know, if you compare it to a digester, if someone just installed a digester alone, that could be $1,500 to $2,000 per cow. If you want to involve adding a digester plus some of these nutrient recovery units, it's increasing the overall capital cost by about 30%, which doesn't seem too bad. And you might think, oh, I can afford that. But what really kills you is that the operating costs, because digesters are not very costly to operate. 
um, the operating cost can go up by 700%. Um, so that, that what can really kill you. And then I told you about that we need a more firm markets for sales of the biofertilizers produced. I think this can be used as a first cut, some of these pricings, to understand what best available technology is and how regulators might be able to interpret what the financial cost is to install these systems. Um, I think the systems should be thought through as a systems approach. Don't just think nutrient recovery, think nutrient recovery, renewable energy, uh, credits, what kind of fuel am I going to make, all those kind of things. And, of course, try to avoid white elephants, which are sometimes always done in, in our science and demonstration projects. Um, I'll just say that don't lose sight of the big picture. Sometimes regulators are only focused on phosphorus or they're only focused on ammonia or nitrate. I think we need to start looking at uh, the big picture and how to control all aspects, not just one that might be at the cost of some others. And we need mechanisms to help these go forward in terms of financing, nutrient trading, new markets, maybe a federal center of excellence to push forward better research and development. And I thank you. Uh, hope you found it informative. Look forward to any questions you have. And I'm going to turn it over to Joe.